Hello, everyone. Welcome to ODI, um, to this public dialogue on uh, Right for Reckoning, Why Saviorism in International Development. I'm Sara Pantuliano. I'm the chief executive here at ODI. I'm really delighted that we are hosting this conversation tonight. We're really pleased to welcome Temriz Khan. Temriz is the co-editor and author of White Saviorism in International Development, Theories, Practice, and Lived Experiences, which was released last month by the Jara Press. She's here today with some of her fellow authors, which will be introduced very shortly, to share us some insights from the book, uh, share with us some insights from the book. And we equally delighted to welcome um, Rob Tell Paley. Um, she's the author of a very influential publication, The White Gaze. And Rob Tell is here to give us her perspective on the issues that are raised in the book that Tamriz and her co-authors have um, put together. But I think most of all, this is an opportunity for all of us to give our own perspectives to the broad set of issues that the book um, raises. And, and I think it's something that here to the eye we've been grappling with for <laughs> some time, actually. Um, it is how to confront the legacies of the white savior mentality that I think runs through the thinking and practice in a particularly glaring way in the international development sector. And it's really time to think how we chart um, a new path you know, towards alternative um, models of solidarity, of international solidarity that are based on equality and justice, including racial justice. So above all, you know, our ambition today is to really offer a space, um, a space where we can continue conversations that have really accelerated since the death of George Floyd in 2020, but actually started before. The definitely started before that here in ODI and in a number of other places, you know, Peace Direct, Oxfam, and other, other organizations, but today are reaching um, other parts of the development sector that are interesting. Look at the OECD um, development cooperation report that has included, you know, just um, uh, very recently a chapter on racism and aid. So I don't think I was, I'd seen that one coming, sorry. Oops. Um, well, it's, uh, what we want to do today, it's actually give um, the floor to those who've been at the receiving end uh, of the International Development Project, or you know, as Teju called, calls it, the um, International Development Complex. Um, because at the same time, and we know that these colleagues are also quite uncomfortably at times participating in, uh, you know, in the system. Um, and we want to also be quite open-eyed about the challenges that we might face when we openly acknowledge you know, the existence of a white savior mentality and culture um, in the international development sector. Uh, as the Guardian journalist Kinan Malik has pointed out, not everything is black and white. And I think that's important because, especially in this country, you know, we see that we have an increasingly ethnically diverse um, high level political office holders, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that, you know, so equality issues are addressed. I think you know, simply replacing white saviors with non-white saviors will not necessarily address historical you know, partners in equalities. And I think saviors of you know, any color can really disrupt the historical patterns in the way knowledge about the global South is produced. Because I think such knowledge tends to be either produced by white people or be informed by ways of knowing and seeing the world that are actually rooted in intellectual traditions that are presumed to be neutral, but are invariably or coincidentally those of white people. And so this is something that, you know, at ODI, um, we are discussing quite deeply. You know, ODI is an organization that has prided itself um, to be um, an evidence-based um, think tank. But in a political climate that is increasingly resistant, I think, to the idea that structural racism <coughs> exists, there is always a little concern that ODI could run the risk of being accused of you know, some form of virtue signaling. So with our trustees, with our board of trustees, we've been very intentional about our direction of travel since um, 2021, um, uh, when our new strategy was, was released 
you know, and, and really made sure that our commitment, which is a commitment to robust evidence-based policy research, uh, is a commitment to policy research with a purpose. And the purpose is to advance equality, um, equity, justice and rights. And so any agenda that seeks to do this cannot be blind to the way racist ideas structure the business that we are in. Um, and so, you know, we have committed to transforming our own approach to knowledge production so that, you know, just and, and equitable partnerships are at the center. And we've called this journey a journey to decolonize our thinking and practice. Um, now, I know that this term is contested, including amongst some of you know those who are in in this room but it's a way we want to acknowledge our own power you know where we stand in relation to the many countries and the many people we've been writing about for more than 60 years um, and the unequal access to power and influence that we have benefited from and we continue to benefit from so for us this conversation that we're really delighted to to host tonight is part of you know, this ambition that we have to decolonize our thinking, our ways of working, our ways of, you know, thinking about what constitutes knowledge as well, you know, it's what some people have called epistemic justice, um, and a way of thinking about how we engage and, and engage with and give up space to producers of knowledge in the global south. So let me end here, dear friends, and really um, let our speakers and all of you speak. And I'm truly looking forward to this discussion that I hope will be, uh, I hope will be open, um, honest, probing, um, so that we can all really think more deeply how we can confront these challenges that face us um, together. And I'll hand over to my dear colleague, Catherine Vajak, who is the director of our politics and governance program, but also the director of our task force on decolonizing um, research and policy to the eye. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Sarah, and welcome to everybody here. It's my pleasure to chair this evening's um, event. Uh, before getting into the meat of things, uh, let me just um, yeah, some, uh, get over some housekeeping details. So we want to encourage a robust conversation and exchange of ideas. So we'd very much like those who are online um, to uh, put their comments, questions in the chat as we go along, but also um, for those who are here present in this room to take note of any questions uh, or comments they want to make as we go along so uh, that during the course of uh, the discussions I can just invite you in. Um, I would also um, just let you know that this is going to be a conversation in three parts essentially, so the first will be uh, inviting our esteemed guests to tell their piece and in, in with, with, with some two back and forth in terms of questions. Uh, the second bit will be uh, inviting Q&A from you, the audience, online and offline. And then uh, the last part will be um, following a follow-up where we will have um, a conversation amongst those here present um, um in 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 a free-flowing um way so welcome everybody um so let me let me kick off so we're delighted uh, to welcome two exceptional thought leaders who are going to help us understand what white saviorism is how it shows up in the our sector the international development sector even though odi itself is 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 a global affairs think tank, um, and what can we what what can be done about it? So we want to invite your reflections, their reflections on these questions. So I'm delighted to introduce first of all Them Rees, as Sarah said. Them Rees has been for many years an independent development professional with over two decades of experience. She's based currently in Pakistan, and she is co-editor of this collection, this edited collection entitled White Saviorism in International <laughs> Development, Theories, Practice, Practices and Lived Experiences. Here it is. So I'm hoping that you will all rush out and buy a copy when it comes out. Um, I just wanted to add that um, Thim Rees is one of many um, authors, uh, as well as the um, co-editor. So I just want to name those other authors uh, with respect. 
So um, first of all, uh, um, Kanakulia Kanakul Dixon, uh, Micah Sondagiri, who have been, who wrote the introduction with Femrys. We also um, have a number of chapters, some anonymously um, uh, written for reasons that we can discuss in later. So Marcelo, Marcello um, Saavedra Vargas, Sadaf Shalwani and Shama Dosa, Leila Benhaducha, and please forgive me if I'm messing up any names here. Um, we also have Kizito Michael George, Rose Esther Sim, Sim, Simat Fleurant, uh, then uh, Robert Kakuru, Fernando David Marquez Duarte, Amjad Mohamed Salim, Chongo Beverly Ann Mwila, Jody Ann Anderson, Radha Shah, Eddie Michael Yao. And I hope I haven't missed anyone. So um, I think it's important to acknowledge that they all contributed to, to this volume. Um, the collection delves uh, into the intimate and ongoing relationship between international development, coloniality, and ideas of whiteness and race. And we're very much looking forward to hearing from them Rees all about it. <laughs> My second uh, panelist is Rob Tell um, Najai Paley, Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Policy at London School of Economics and is recognized, as Sarah's pointed out, for her contributions and critical theorization of what she's called the white gaze in international development, um, which she's invited us all to dissenter in an article <laughs> first published in 2019 in Development and Change. Welcome, Rob Tell. Welcome, Emrys. Before kicking off, um, I'd just like to throw in one or two little observations. So although the book is focused on international development, this is not a conversation, thankfully, that is restricted to this space. International development is not just a sector in the same way that finance is a sector, but more like a worldview or ideological paradigm, call it mindset, about how the world and relationships within it are structured. So the worldview permeates popular narratives norms and ideas. And it's not surprising that Teju Cole's seminal <clears throat> article on the white savior industrial complex, I'll refer to it earlier, was, um, was uh, not published in the Journal of Development Studies, but in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some 10 years ago now, over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it was my daughter, a 14 year old Parisian, Nigerian, Algerian Brit, <laughs> <laughs> who shook her head at me in the kitchen a few weeks ago in a way far too old and wise for her years, admonishing the white savior so-called humanitarian celebrities that were being lambasted and even canceled on social media for what used to be called poverty porn in Africa. She had no idea that I would be chairing this panel today. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, let's get on with it. So Femrys, over to you. So you've talked about how a piece published in 2012 by Teddy Cole inspired this book. The short essay outlines what he called the white industrial, savior industrial complex. Could you explain a bit what inspired your work and what you and your co-authors understand by white saviorism and how it applies to your book and in the international development sector? Over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Sarah. First of all, thank you for having uh, me here and hosting this event without knowing me or anyone else and um, really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for this. And thank you all for coming today. It's lovely to be back in London after I think almost a decade now. <laughs> um, so the book, um, my co-editor, Mike Sandaji, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada, she approached me with the idea of exploring white saviorism as a not just an academic concept or a theoretical concept, but a very practical uh, inaction concept as it is used in international development. That's one of her subjects of, of uh, teaching and study as well. And I being the practitioner, uh, when she first approached me, I was like, what do you mean white saviorism in international development? I mean, what, do you, what, what exactly do you want to achieve with this? And um, her thought process was, 
of exactly this, you know, the entire celebrity culture that's taking over the world um, and poverty porn and everybody out there to do good, uh, you know, and, and to make sure that everybody knows who's done that good for whom needs to be really questioned. Uh, and that hasn't been done so. And she was influenced by Peju Cole's uh, 2012 article, which then I, when I read, I realized, I said, okay, this is something we can actually work with. And it, it resonated with me as well, uh, being a development practitioner for so long in Pakistan. Um, and together with uh, Kanatulia Dixon, who is a professor at uh, Makarera University in Uganda, the three of us sat together and we talked about it and said, okay, so what exactly it is, is it do we want to achieve with this? And we came up with three, three things. One, we wanted to challenge and bring out into the open the idea of white saviorism uh, as something that exists and is alive and well in the national development sector. Secondly, we wanted to, and thank you very much for reading out the names of all our contributors that really, really, I mean, they are the book themselves. Secondly, we wanted to bring to the fore voices that had never been heard before. So we've got a lot of books coming out on international development, primarily uh, from you know, the Western world and through the white gaze, as, as, as Dr. Hill knows very well. But we wanted to hear voices from people who had actually worked in the sector and had worked in the sector without being known who they were. Uh, so we wanted them, we didn't want known uh, names, we wanted unknown names. Um, and thirdly, we wanted to really explore what everybody is calling lived experiences. So we wanted stories. We didn't want theory. We didn't want um, you know, conceptual uh, ideas. We wanted actually stories of people who had worked in the sector and we wanted to know what they had gone through um, in, their, in their careers uh, in terms of white saviorism. So we put out a call uh, for papers and we were very fortunate. We got a number of abstracts. And um, we just let them do whatever they wanted to do. We had no guidelines for the book. We said, we want to know how white saviorism has impacted your work in international development and say what you want. And we just took it from there. And this is what we ended up with at the end of the day. It was a difficult journey, but it was also a very easy journey simply for the fact that people had so much to say you know, it, it was very difficult for us to pick these pieces out of the abstracts we got. We were limited for the space we had, but it was just literally, you tell people to start talking about their experiences and you let the floodgates open. So that was really our, our uh, the process behind the book. Um, and we only opened the call to members of the Global South. Um, having said that, we got a lot of abstracts from members of the Global North who insisted that, no, we want to talk about our experiences of white saviorism and why it's very important for white people to go into non-white countries and help them. So, of course, needless to say, we rejected those applications, those abstracts, <laughs> but, you know, they did come in. So, you know, that tells you a little bit about how people interpret um, or don't interpret um, guidelines, I guess. Um, we had a lot of discussion about the concept of white saviorism itself. We started off, the book's title was The White Savior Complex. That was its initial title. And then the more we thought about it, we realized that the white savior complex sort of addresses more at an, more of an individual, at an individual level, their thought process about being the white savior. Whereas we wanted to look at uh, the issue at a more overall holistic community level as in white saviorism being a mindset, not necessarily the action of a individual and how that mindset uh, is imbibed in the history of country and colonial history and the way we do things and have been doing things for years. So we decided we won't go with the white savior complex, we're going to go with white saviorism because that's just a much creates a broader picture for us. How we defined it, and I'll just read that out from the book, and this took us a long, long time to come up with this definition. I mean, we really struggled with it. Uh, but basically we ended up with defining white saviorism as an often ignored overarching structure in the field of international development. It is simultaneously a state of mind and a, contra a concrete unequal power structure between the global North and the global South. White saviorism is founded on the benevolence of whiteness which elevates people of white European descent, despite their role in exploiting and dispossessing people from the global South. So this is how we wanted our contributors also to contextualize their own writings and their own experiences and their own work. 
And um, it was very interesting to see, I mean, we can talk a little bit more about the contributions themselves later on. But everybody interpreted white saviorism in a different way, but with the same idea that the whiteness is what controls the sector and the attitudes that whiteness brings, be it, like Sarah said, brown people or black people, it is an ingrained systemic issue. So this is also why we didn't want to take it down to the individual level, because I can be a brown savior. You can be a black savior, depending on your positionality, where you are, the power that you wield, the power that the institution you work for wields. So that was a huge finding from the book, from what, what we guessed. And, and the reason we had um, anonymous contributors as well was exactly for this reason that people were actually scared of speaking out, because a lot of some of them were still working in the sector. And uh, we gave people the option consciously in our call for papers uh, to be uh, credited anonymously because we knew people would not come forward otherwise because it's such a wrought sector with so many complex issues. So a couple of our contributors did take on that, that offer mm -hmm. and they did contribute anonymously, which tells you a lot about where the sector is right now and the acceptance of these issues. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you, thank is, you very much. I mean, I think I, I'll just, just reflect a little bit on some of the things that you've said. So the reason why you didn't want to use the word complex was because you wanted to step beyond the individualization, the individual level. But interestingly, the way Ted Cole uses the term mm -hmm. industrial yes. complex yes. speaks to something which is much more structural. Yes. Complex is a complex word. <laughs> it can be interpreted <laughs> yeah. in many ways, but I just wanted to just like put that out there. No, absolutely, Particularly yeah. at a time when there was that discussion, a lot of heated discussion about white fragility. Mm -hmm. and that yes. So I can understand yes. why you would have wanted to shy away from perhaps mm -hmm. uh, the, the ambivalence of that, of that word. I want to just uh, bring you in now, <laughs> Rob Tell. So um, your, as I said, you know, your, percept, your, 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 your work around the gays has been very, um, very influential picked up yes yes it is true there have been many of debate he cited hats. in our book in one of our chapters I, I, noted, I, noted, I, noted, so, yes. <laughs> I noted that i noted that but it's been the, the it's been very um influential and has sparked a lot of debate so um how does your concept of of white gays differ or relate to uh the the the, the white saviorism um that uh, Ben Reese and her colleagues have um, described. Sure, thank you, Catherine. Um, and I wanna echo what Sarah said about thanking the ODI for hosting this, thanking all of you for coming. You could have been doing anything with your uh, Wednesday <laughs> evening, but you decided to be here with us to celebrate this really, really brilliant book. Um, and before I answer your question, um, Catherine, I just wanna say kudos to Ben Reese all of her co-editors and the contributors of the book, because I know you said that you didn't want this to be about pontificating and theorizing and coming up with some sort of conceptual framework, but that's precisely what you did. <laughs> did and I think and what I take from this book is this idea of lived experience being a site of knowledge production. Mm -hmm. And you've done that so beautifully, so, so beautifully, you and your co-author. So I just wanna say thank you. thank you. The fact that you also centered Global South contributors, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is a testament to the kind of intentionality about framing these issues around equity and justice. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll say is one of the things that kept ringing in my head as I was reading the book or excerpts of it is this quote that I, that I often tell to my students um, from Arundhati Roy, the activist, author, extraordinaire, justice warrior from India. And she says that there's no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. And what you do in this book is that you bring to the fore the deliberately silenced and the preferably unheard. And I didn't even realize that this is a story in which the, the book came together is that you purposely and intentionally wanted people who hadn't been recognized in the spaces and places that we often occupy. So definitely no such thing as the, the voiceless. There's only the no, deliberately no, no. silenced and the preferably heard. Thank you for framing that um, throughout the book. But in terms of um, how I, I, I think that white saviorism and the white gaze of development are twin, but perhaps might differ mm -hmm. is for people who aren't familiar with the article that I wrote. So it was based on a Development Studies Association conference keynote that I gave in 2019 in, was it, where were we? Where were we, Nyla? Open University. Open University, thank you very much. 
<laughs> and the way that I, I sort of define the white gaze of development, and I'll, I'll read it because I don't want to make sure I want to make sure that I don't um, muck it up. But the idea is that you know the white gaze of development is when you measure the political, economic, um, cultural processes of Black, Brown, and other people of color against the standard of Northern whiteness. And what you do beyond that measurement is that you find them wanting, you find them regressive, you find them lacking in something, right? So there's a there's a dearth. Um, when you're thinking about these socio-political economic processes of black and brown and other people of color. And I think white saviorism is very, very much part and parcel of that, right? So there are lots of synergies between what I talk about, this idea of the white gaze of development and the white saviorism, in that white saviorism and the white gaze of development are both sort of both depend on what Hannah Aaron calls the politics of pity. And if you're familiar with the politics of pity, is essentially when you come into a space or place and you think that you bring all the answers, you bring all the solutions. And the way you do this is you dehumanize those who might be at the so-called deserving end of that, um, that largesse, right? That, that, that pity. Um, and I think the white saviorism trope definitely is part and parcel of the idea of the politics of pity, dehumanizing those who might be considered less than you, right? Not human, right? And so you have to swoop in and provide all the solutions to them. I think the other thing is that in terms of the politics of pity, you also frame these particular individuals as lacking agency, as lacking the knowledgeability, as lacking the capacity to really define their own solutions, um, to chart their own um, destinies. I think another synergy that I picked up from reading Themrisa's book is that white saviorism and the white gaze of development are also about maintaining hierarchies and structures of power and domination based on race. So based on race, but also based on place, right? So we talk a lot about that, the, the, the two spheres of influence, the so-called global north and the so-called global south. So it's more than just about racialization. It's also about placement, right? In terms of, of geographic placement. I think the other thing I've um, picked up is, you know, it's also based on racial, but also material forms of, of domination, right? Capitalism thrives from the white gaze of development in the same way that capitalism th thrives from, from white saviorism. The other thing that I picked up, and I thought this was really sharp that your, your co-authors picked up, and a number of people in, in a number of different chapters picked up on this, is that white saviorism and the white gaze of development both demonstrate, and you mentioned this, how Black, Brown, and other people of color can also internalize, can also imbibe, can also mimic pathologies of white saviorism, right? So how do they serve as agents of white saviorism? And I've seen this in my own work. So I'll give you an example just to make it a bit more concrete. So I worked in Liberia for four years and I talk about this in the White Gaze of Development article. Um, and I worked for the government of Liberia for four years. And not only did I see the racialization between white and black or white and brown, but I also saw hierarchies of power, hierarchies of domination, material as well as um, power dynamics within Liberian um, uh, sort of interactions, right? So what I saw was those Liberians who had come from abroad, so they called us importees, for instance, myself included, we importees who've come from abroad also imbibe the spirit of so-called white saviorism, because as far as we were concerned, Liberians who had left, who never left during the war, had a lot to learn from us. And so we came in with a spirit of hubris, not a spirit of humility. We came, up, came in with a spirit of contempt, not a spirit of collaboration. And to a, certain, to a certain extent, you see that kind of play out in the sort of swooping in white savior who comes mm -hmm. to provide the solutions for those black and brown people who clearly don't have the capacity, they don't have the agency, they don't have the knowledgeability. And so I was really pleased that you were able to tease that out because I think sometimes when we're talking about these issues, they often are in forms of black and white. But how do we internalize as Black, Brown, and other Indigenous peoples or peoples of color imbibe the spirit, um, the ideas of white saviorism, and, and the way that we interact with our own with our own people, right? In terms of differences, I think I'm I'm a little less generous than than recent <laughs> co, <laughs> or maybe I should say more cynical, <laughs> um, having worked as an international development practitioner, but now also working in. Um, a space where I see white saviorism kind of play out in academia, right? So I'm a little less generous. And I think that one of the differences I picked up on in terms of the idea of white saviorism or the idea of white 
um, the white gaze of development is I don't really believe that white saviors are as well intentioned as some of the authors kind of um, mentioned. Um, and I think the book kind of gives them a pass because <laughs> you use that word a lot, that phrase mm -hmm. a lot, you know, the well-intentioned, the well-intentioned, the well-intentioned. I don't believe that that's the case. In mm -hmm. fact, in many respects, I think that the white gaze of development, what I try to do throughout the article is to demonstrate that the privileging of Western whiteness and modernity is very exacting, it's intentional, and it's deliberate. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything that's well-intentioned about it at all. So I'll just leave it there, but I just want to thank you for your contributions, Ben <laughs> no, Reese. Thank you. This thank is you so a much. brilliant book. Please get a copy and have them Reese <laughs> autograph it for you. <laughs> this is Thank you very much, Rob Tell. And, I, and, I, and I'd like to pick up on what you just said there, you know, so first of all, you commented on the the, 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 the degree to which the problem is about internalizing uh, the white gaze, be you black, be you brown. Um, and it reminds me of Ibuki uh, Biongo's Decolonizing mm. the Mind, of, uh, whenever that was mm. written, um, because it seems that that job is, is still to be done mm. um, amongst ourselves. And, you know, I think I just, I just want to just have that hanging for us to kind of consider how the book, because it's, you know, enables us to internalize the job to be done. But to the critique, I know this is a co-edited co mm -hmm. volume, but, you know, do your authors let, let uh, give, give your, give, give those white saviors who are well-intentioned a pass? <laughs> and what would, what would a more, radical um, um, approach look like? Well, you have to wait for my individual book to see the radical approach. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do that in the matriarchy complex. I mean, that, that's a really powerful chapter. Yeah, yeah, that is. Um, so see, this all goes back to us to do things, I think. Um, and you're right, you're absolutely right. I think it's not necessarily giving it a pass, mm -hmm. but I think it is in a way de being defensive contributors being slightly defensive and you know the anonymity was part of that because there is still a discomfort with actually being very honest about what you faced in your life right it's still not easy to go out there and say you know what we are not being heard you have really messed us up, up uh, us up all these years and we refuse to put up with this anymore it's not easy to say that when you haven't done it your entire life mm -hmm. So I think there was, um, and it's really interesting that you pointed out because we really didn't pick up on it in that sense that you did. Mm. But yes, I think there is uh, still everybody is trying to play it a little safe, mm. you know, so that element is there. I think that is there because there is a fear of sort of being uh, discriminated against even further. There is um, this we're still not, a lot of people are still not used to being so honest about this topic for a lot of the practitioners in particular for the lived experience. It was the first time they'd ever written about these experiences, you know, the, what in, in their careers. So, I mean, I, I would give them a little bit of leeway and relaxation as well for that. Uh, but I think a couple of people were very hard hitting about what they said, but, but we did not want to push an agenda on any of our contributors, right? As if you're not comfortable writing about certain things. And we rejected a couple of chapters too halfway in, uh, because we just thought that this is just not being honest enough. Right. And people are, you know, they're trying to mince their words to, and it's just not giving the same impact and it's not their fault. But we didn't want the book to reflect that sort of an image. We wanted things to be as raw as possible. So how did you not mince your words in your chapter um, on uh, matriarchy? <laughs> if you just say a few words about how you... Sure. Well, I don't mince my them. words anymore. I used to. I used to. My entire career was based mm. on mincing words. And what changed you? What changed you? Just the, the sector itself. And it's lack of, of uh, empathy, it's lack of direction, the issue of control, the issue of no change over the decade that one has worked for it. Aisha Zia, Aisha and I have worked together 20 years ago. It was one of my first research projects that I, I, I worked with Aisha in Karachi. And fabulous learning, fabulous learning, but nothing actually happening on the ground when it comes to the international development sector and working with donors. So that sort of changed my, my mind. But my chapter is, do you want to yes, go just okay. a little bit. Yeah. All right. Uh, so my chapter is called The Matriarchy Complex, um, White Feminist Disruption and Development. And it uh, focuses on 
with all due respect, white women in particular coming into countries like mine and um, acting as if, you know, they own us, which is what the sector itself does. And we know the sector is primarily made up of men, white men, and we know they do it. But the idea, you know, when we talk about gender, we think, you know, there's a sisterhood amongst us. And because we're women, we're all on the same page. Well, actually, we're not. So it's a lot of it is about my own experiences, about dealing with the women coming in from the UK, Europe, North America. And I was the local consultant sort of piggybacking with them on various projects and just their attitudes and their behavior and how that reflected on my own capacities and my own ability to be, uh, to have my own independent thought process. But what I also did was I requested some people that I knew from different parts of uh, the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, to reflect on this issue themselves. So I was very lucky to have about four or five contributions uh, from colleagues from all these different continents who gave me their contributions about how they reflected white women coming into their countries and treating them. And those were eye-openers for me as well. One of them was from, um, a colleague of mine in Pakistan as well, who brought up the issue of uh, Latin American consultants coming in and not treating us very well, uh, us brown people. Right. Um, and we would think there's an affinity there somewhere, but there is not. And that was very interesting to see, you know, how white women come and treat black and brown women, but we're talking about, you know, like misty brown women coming in and not treating us very well. So there is that undercurrent, it just doesn't have to do with white versus non-white. It's there everywhere. And, I, and my argument is that it's the institution that influences that mindset, right. which is why we talk about saviorism as a mindset, right. because it's a systemic influencer. And do you think, so, and do you think, you know, um, and it's back to the, are you letting people off the hook? You mm -hmm. know, do you think that there are continuities um, that are unavoidable between, you know, this space, the international development space, and you know, colonial ideas, coloniality, ideas of whiteness and race. Is that the problem that there hasn't been a, a rupture? In the sector itself? In the sector itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've a number of people, I mean, there's a whole current of thinking mm -hmm. which sees international development as yet an extension of a colonial project. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's very much the thinking. I personally don't agree with that. I know some of our authors do, and again, that's that's their prerogative. I know my co-editors do as well. Um, but I diverge on that uh, point because I feel where we are today is not necessarily just the result of a colonial project, an ongoing colonial project, you know, in a post-colonial world. <clears throat> I think there is a lot that we have to take responsibility for ourselves which is not the result of colonialism, but a result of perhaps how we decided as independent countries to take our own uh, states and societies forward. And I think that's not being looked at at all. And my, my argument is, which people look at me and they go, what? Is stop blaming colonialism for everything. You know, we need to move past that. Nobody is denying the influence of colonialism on the world today. It absolutely does exist in different forms. But we cannot be stuck on that aspect. We have to move beyond that and see what we ourselves are doing and why we're doing and how we're doing it and what are we doing wrong. And I think there are lots of examples of that in front of us in Pakistan itself and, and in other countries as well. So I think the impact and influence of colonialism and the whiteness of colonialism, I think we've passed that point. Um, because you talk about multilaterals, for instance, which say, well, we're very global. You know, We've got people of all the, ethnicities and, and you know, racial backgrounds working with us. We are truly global. We work all over the world this together. Well, no, actually you don't because your system is white. So that's where I bring in the whiteness that the system is still very white, not necessarily colonial. Um, but we ourselves have imbibed um, a sense of superiority that may have come down from colonialism that may not have come down from colonialism. So I try and, and I try and not center colonialism as the, the, the reason for, for all wrongs in the world. 
Right. And can I can I ask you to come in on this, Rob Tell? <laughs> I mean, how does this sound? Does it how does this sit with you? Well, I mean, I I, I don't think of colonialism as something that happened in the past only. I mean, Kwame Nkrumah talked about neocolonialism mm -hmm. and, I, and I see the neocolonialism in terms of trade imbalances. I see neocolonialism mm -hmm. in terms of who gets hired, whose knowledge is revered and valued, even in my own institution, the LSE. I see colonialism in the ways in which we decide who, um, who, who, is, who is a theory, who is a mm -hmm. theorist that we're going to, to then take on as, 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 as our bread and butters. Um, I mean, I see colonialism everywhere. So I have a colonialism tinted glasses. <laughs> I, I don't see that it's gone away. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. So I just found out recently that the US government is considering using Liberia, my country, as a base for um, African command. <laughs> And the US government used Liberia as a base yeah. during the Cold War for its um, military um, exploits. And now we're in the 21st century and this is being considered by our, our head of state. I think of that as a form of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Is that really so surprising? Given, have you seen the size of the US embassy in Liberia compared well, to anywhere have else you seen, in the world? Have you seen the size of the US embassy anywhere in the in world? world? In, in Liberia. Liberia. Yeah. In Liberia. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, can't, you can't commit all these atrocities and not mm. barricade yourself against it. But I, but I, will, say, <laughs> I will say that in terms of going back to the Reese, Reese's points about in, or development not being a colonial enterprise solely. I mean, think about all the post-independence heads, heads of state who took on development as a domestic mm -hmm. enterprise, right? I think of Kwame Nkrumah. I think of people like, um, from my neck of the woods, um, people like um, uh, Thomas Sankara. I think of people like, I mean, the list goes on and on mm -hmm. and on. These were not, these were post-independence leaders mm -hmm. who had experienced colonialism, yeah. who were very much about fighting the system and dismantling it, but they took on development as a domestic national enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about international development versus global development, I often tell my students that global development tends to think of development as about the entire world, right? So every country is developing and it's not just about the so-called global South. So as far as global development scholars are concerned, development is not the province of the so-called global South. You know what I mean? If you think about um, um, Amartya Sen's notion of, of capabilities or even unfreedoms, mm -hmm. unfreedoms exist everywhere, right? We're here in the UK and people are striking because they're not being paid a living wage, you know? That is an unfreedom. That's a development issue, even though you might not think about it in the mainstream definition. So I think when we're thinking about international development, that's why that's when I find it to be problematic because international development tends to frame these issues around poverty exactly. and inequality as a province of the so-called global south. And what's interesting to me is my students now are not walking around with like pull cool quotes saying global development, international development, so-called global south, so-called global <laughs> north, because they realize that these terms are incredibly, incredibly contested. Mm -hmm. And that's what we as we as practitioners, but also mm -hmm. scholars and educators come in is to really indoctrinate the next generation of practitioners mm -hmm. and or scholars in development to think about these issues as more of a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. as a global kind of challenge, mm -hmm. and not just about the so-called global south. So I think that's where I kind of when I'm thinking about development. It wasn't something that came from Harry Truman, right? Mm -hmm. Kwame Nkrumah was just as committed to development of Ghana mm -hmm. as a so-called Harry Truman thought, oh, we can develop these underdeveloped places. So thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I think I'd like to just take the temperature of the room a bit. Does, does anybody have any questions, burning questions that they want to ask any of our panelists? Yeah. And if someone <laughs> could help me with those questions online. Um, there have been questions put in the chat. Um, can someone please help me to read those questions in the chat? Because I can't see them from where I am. Okay, could you read them out and, and maybe we'll, we'll divide them up between our speakers? Over to you, Megan. Hi, yes. So we have our first question from Rosalind Sulaka. Um, do you have any thoughts on international standards being primarily developed by Western countries and what effect this has? In particular, I believe Western policies and cultures create global standards that are sometimes unattainable for other cultures. This means non-Western countries are striving for an elite standard that doesn't necessarily suit them, but they may be sanctioned for not meeting those standards. Any others? I, I want to take a few. If you could just summarize and so that we could give, give them both a chance to comment. Megan. Any, any other um, questions in the chat? Or does anybody else have any questions in the room? 
We do have another question. Go on ahead. Here. Yep. So Leah Akampong has written, thank you for this insightful discussion. I wonder if the panelists see the white gaze of development reflected in financial mechanisms used by MDVs, IFIs and DFIs. For instance, do you see that emerging economies that have populations that are black and brown are more likely to receive loans that include fiscal policy conditionalities compared to emerging economies in say Eastern Europe? Or do you see that racialized communities within a country are less likely to have access to development finance flows than those from less marginalized communities. Right. Okay. One last question, and then I'll hand over to our panelists. Yeah. No. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, it's been quite a lot. I think my question is uh, to pick up on the interaction between you two around. Can you just take the mic. Oh, sorry. For the, for the recording. Yes. Mm. Around um, to what extent are national leaders? Mm -hmm culpable in mm -hmm. reproducing forms of neocolonialism. And I feel, and this is my discomfort about the word decolonization, mm -hmm. yeah. is precisely that it has been taken up by rather nasty leaders mm -hmm. as a counter to some of the more progressive elements of Western thinking mm -hmm. around rights and individual rights and so on, mm -hmm. to say this is not our values, these are not our values, mm -hmm. and so you are guilty of you know, trying to colonize and mm -hmm. uh, demote the things that we take. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think you let the national leaders have a look. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I give them a pass. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much. <laughs> I think we'll, okay, start perhaps <clears throat> with the, the last question and then look at the finance question as well. And if you have comments on the first, um, that'd be, that'd be great. Go over to you, Rochelle. Sure. Do you let them have a hook? Yeah, yeah, leaders? yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, I think you're talking specifically about current national leaders or post-independence national Not leaders. Post -independence. Current leaders, leaders right now. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And 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 I think maybe I can give an example from from the continent of Africa. And I, I always tell my students, I'm sorry, but this is my default because mm -hmm. I'm politically committed to the continent of Africa, but I'm also scholarly committed to the continent of Africa. So I don't know if you've been familiar with the debate that's happening in Uganda right now yeah. about the anti-homosexuality um, yes. bill that's probably, if it's not already passed, it's going to be passed mm -hmm. by the parliament mm -hmm. in Uganda. And my colleague, Hakan Sekchenelgen um, from Turkey has written this really brilliant article about um, anti-LGBT activism in the continent of Africa. But what's ironic is that a lot of leaders, Mugabe, the late Mugabe, now Museveni, a number of other leaders in the continent of Africa, and also outside of the continent of Africa, have basically said these anti-LGBTQ activists are non-African because they are promoting principles and values that are non-African. What's interesting and ironic, and actually quite bombastic, is the fact that it was colonial penal codes that were instituted in parts of Latin America, Africa, and Asia that created the sort of anti-homophobia mm -hmm. sentiments. Yeah. So now, so-called decolonial mm -hmm. heads of state are taking up Victorian values that were embedded in colonial penal codes and saying, this is not African. So I agree with you, Nyla. I think absolutely mm -hmm. there are leaders who in many respects are incredibly problematic and will use the decolonial rhetoric to pass laws, pass legislation, pass rules, pass regulations that ultimately are anti-human. Mm -hmm. Mm. And my point is, just, sorry, just to take up from that, is that I just cannot let leaders off the hook mm. uh, of the present day uh, and some of the past, because that's supposedly our future, right? And using the rise of, uh, and again, I am not denying the existence of colonialism in different forms today, mm -hmm. but using that has become also the default option of getting away with things. That it's not us, we were left with this legacy. Well, what were you doing with this legacy for the last 70 years? You've had that time to change it. Why didn't you, right? So that is also a fallback option to say, no, it's not our fault. It was their fault because they did it. And I think the international development sector, the discussions that are happening now are doing exactly the same thing. We're going to a default option where we are actually not looking internally at what we could do independently and how we could improve our lives. We're using the excuse, no, no, colonialism had set these systems and these structures in place. And so we have no choice. We are now uh, facing the effects of it. Again, 
you have an opportunity to change it. Why aren't you? Yeah, and there's agency as well. And there's agency as well. So that is it. It's all just become a ruse and an excuse. And so has decolonization. And what about the question of MDBs and how we find and financial uh, institutions that replicate um, legacies uh, and, uh, and a white, how, how, do we, how does white saviorism present itself? <laughs> in these spaces <laughs> well if anyone knows me they know how much i am not a proponent of aid and i know that's one of the questions that'll come up later i'm, I'm a proponent of reparations <laughs> oh um, and i am not so. <laughs> oh, oh that's interesting again. where yeah, we differ yeah, okay yeah. not a proponent um, of aid but not reparations either okay so. fair enough <laughs> i'd love to hear your thoughts on that um i i think i mean if you look at the international financial institutions and increasingly i mean i've i've i have a whole lecture on how um uh, regional development banks like the uh, Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank mm -hmm. or the Inter-American Development Bank are very much modeled after the World Banks and the IMFs, mm -hmm. right? They, yeah. In terms of the, their ideological makeup, they don't really differ. Although I will say, having worked for the African Development Bank, in many respects, African countries see the African Development Bank as a partner of choice more than they would the World Bank because the idea is that the AFDB sees sees Africa <laughs> and yeah. understands its unique challenges in a way that the World Bank wouldn't necessarily. But I think just the model that they've sort of set up, um, they're very, very hierarchical. So we know that the World Bank, for instance, will never have a president from the so-called Global South, even though there might be black and brown presidents of the World Bank, but they're always from the United States in the same way that you always have a European head of the IMF. Just that institutionalized is a problem. I'm not a fan of the IMF. I'm certainly not a fan of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting from that premise, then obviously there's something wrong with that, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is these banks were not really intended to transform countries' mm -hmm. economies. Yeah. They were intended to make countries more reliant on mm -hmm. them so that they could continually self-perpetuate, mm -hmm. right? So if you start from that premise, then they're problematic. If you're thinking about white saviorism or even mm -hmm. the white gaze of development. The other thing to remember is a lot of these financial institutions or even commercial lenders, for instance, will give loans to countries that might be considered so-called emerging. And I hate that term, but mm -hmm. the idea of a, mm -hmm. an emerging country is mm -hmm. quite problematic for me. But they'll give these loans to so-called emerging economies at very, very high interest rates. Mm -hmm. So you're already starting off within a deficit, right? So I always tell people, my students are probably tired of me hearing or hearing me saying this ad nauseum, it's not that Africa borrows exponentially more than other regions of the mm -hmm. world. It's Africa borrows at very, very, very high interest rates. And that's why you have countries like Zambia that are debt distressed. That's why you have countries like my own that are debt distressed. It's not because these leaders are going amok borrowing and borrowing and borrowing but they're borrowing at high interest rates because the moody's of the world and the standard whatever those those um rating agencies mm -hmm. have basically branded these countries as non-viable so i think you know as, as students we have to really kind of unpack deconstruct why these systems are put in place deliberately and that's why i say i think the white saviorism is exacting it's deliberate and it's mm -hmm. intentional there's nothing well intentioned about it no, in the same way that you can think absolutely. about the hierarchies of these international financial institutions are also very deliberate. They're not meant to transform. They're meant to maintain the status quo. Thank you very much. I've got, um, we've got seven more minutes of this conversation. Uh -huh. I'm going to allow that question. And then I'll ask you both perhaps to respond with your concluding remarks. I haven't got through everything, <laughs> but we've got time for, for, for further chat afterwards but can we hear from Therese about the reparations I, I just want to get there <laughs> yeah I know we I, I, I was tempted in my mind I, I was mind. tempted okay. but I think we will have time afterwards okay. if I could just take this question and you're in you can respond to the reparations question if you so choose hi um thanks uh, Thamiz. I'm I'm interested in just exploring the tension a little bit between what we know about the kind of leaders we have mm -hmm. in our countries mm -hmm. our post-colonial countries mm -hmm. and um of course the critique of the development sector mm -hmm. that um, is valid in its own right. Mm -hmm. And um, with respect to movement on women's issues, for example, mm -hmm. there are tensions within the development sector mm -hmm. and feminists in development have struggled really hard to ally themselves with women in the countries where they have worked mm -hmm. to achieve some really remarkable outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
it's interesting to see that alliances have been forged even amongst NGOs from the West, development aid agencies and countries like Pakistan, when there were feminists working there who worked in alliance with women's groups in Pakistan and managed over years to achieve things um, like uh, electoral quota for women in politics that was in large part a donor funded yet grassroots mobilization campaign at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think the negotiation within the development sector for movement on mm -hmm. gender is something that's, I don't know if you've explored in your book, but I think it's an interesting tension because mm -hmm. it's where women in a country like Pakistan managed to gain allies against what would have been a very obstructive government mm -hmm. um, to make progress on um, certain gains for women. Right. Thank you very much for that question. And I want to just hand over now to Tim Rees mm -hmm. If you have perhaps some reflections on that, if you dare the reparations <laughs> question <laughs> or challenge, and then final remarks from both of you. Okay. Over to you, Tamriz. Okay. No, absolutely, Ash. I agree with you there. Um, and this is not a blanket approach, right? We also one of the issues that we've tried to cover in our in our conclusion is that it's 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 a country to country and a region to region experience. Every country has had its own you know, political history, social history, and how colonialism or aid has interacted with that will also uh, influence the outcome. So absolutely, but I think there is also a change in terms of, so what happens after, right? So you set a foundation in place and then you expect the country to take that forward. And I think that's where we need to now focus. Okay, you've done your job, uh, you've set this up, and now we need to make it better and we need to expand it. And I think that's where we need the critique. That's where we need more movement, more domestic movement. Um, and I think in the feminist, I mean, you know about the Oric March as well as I do. I mean, they are a group that do not want anything to do with the donor community, you know? And that's one way of seeing how this uh, is playing out in different countries. But I think there is some utility and there may not be some utility in other areas. You know, gender may be an area where it's been partially successful or particularly successful. In another area, let's say education, it hasn't, right? So I think it's it's not a black and white situation either. But um, I mean, personally speaking, I think because there's no national uptake moving forward in terms of you know how we position ourselves, that is to me the issue, the main issue. Um, in terms of reparations, okay, I'll be controversial <laughs> because I'm the I'm the queen of unpopular takes. <laughs> so here goes. I just feel the way, and it's all about framing, right? Yeah. So even the whole idea of colon, colonialism, it's all about how we frame things, decolonization, how we're framing it in the context of aid. I think reparations right now is, from the way I see it, all about money, right? It's about pay us back from what you stole. But for me, that's not the only issue. I think repar true reparations is when you talk about equality and equity between countries in decision-making, mm -hmm. in political alliances, in social cohesion. Reparations is not just about, and in aid, it's even more controversial because it means giving more aid to countries, half of which we should not even get yeah, to the yeah, countries, yeah, yeah. right? Climate reparations, billions of dollars. Even if it does get to a country, what is the country going to do with it? If they can mess I, it up, then everybody will accuse them. Can the I just perhaps? So that's why I just feel thank, reparations. Thank you very not. much for that. And ODI has done some very interesting work convening conversations around reparations, which I'd invite you all to perhaps take a look at. I do think it is a, a much more mixed bag, perhaps, and that, um, you know, I think it's also about reconciling hmm. with the need for reckoning you know um <laughs> on this i think it was very interesting the guardian this morning i don't know if anyone saw the guardian's big piece very you know on on the cotton um industry and also how the guardian as an institution looking at its own hmm. legacies it's uh, the, the legacy of slavery in terms of setting up the guardian i was completely flawed hmm. in reading that but um, I would invite you all to think about that this moment, even if we don't know quite where it's going, this moment is very important in terms of institutions reconciling themselves with their own past as a beginning. But for you, uh, Rob Tell, uh, some final concluding remarks. We didn't have a chance to cover anything, <laughs> but perhaps, you know, you spoke of a critique of development as 
you know, your your reflections on the on the white gaze mean that it's not the develop, you know, not the aid path that will, will set us free, if you like. So what will set us free? Is it global development? Um, as you described, if you want to say a few words. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I think I've increasingly become more interested or intrigued by this idea of global development, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of looking at inequalities within countries mm -hmm. as much as inequalities between countries or mm -hmm. between spheres of, of influence. So I would say that's the way forward, mm -hmm. right? That, that all of us are battling unfreedoms. <laughs> Um, no matter where we are, they might look different in terms of the guise of the unfreedoms might look different, but for the, the fact of the matter is um, racial, a racial reckoning is happening in the United States, which for me is a site of empire, right, in the 21st century. Um, uh, you know, police brutality is an unfreedom for a lot of black and brown people in the United States in the same way they might say that it's the case here in the UK. So yeah, global development for me is, is, is the way in which I would like to see the sector go, just in terms of the ways in which we analyze these issues as not just being the province of the so-called global south. The other thing I'll say is, going back to Themrisa's work on white saviorism and even decentering the white gaze of development is to ask ourselves, right? We know that this is systemic, but systems are made of individuals. So to be more self-reflexive mm -hmm. <laughs> and not only our practice, but our ideas, our ideologies, and how we comport ourselves in these spaces and places, because I think that's equally important, um, that it's not, again, white saviorism can be imbibed, it can be internalized, it can be acted, it can be performed by people who look like me, and mm -hmm. as much as it can yeah. be performed Very and imbibed much. and acted, and enacted by people who don't look like me, mm -hmm. so. Well, on those wise words, Rob Tell, I think I'm going to draw this um, event to a close. I want to thank you heartily, first of all, Femrees and you. your co-authors for you. an amazing <laughs> opportunity that you've given us all to, to debate this, to begin to unravel this very uh, thorny set of issues. And also to you, Rob Tell, for being such a, 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 a wonderful um, guest, a wonderful discussion uh, panelist. Uh, <laughs> panelist. We have to um, say, we're going to do 2.0 in uh, Canada. There's a conference coming know, up yes. where we're both in conversation. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. So we'll so we'll have in Toronto run. in May. Practice <laughs> 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 run, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a journey that we, we're really delighted that we're on. And I think the, the, the you know, acknowledging our own you know the need to reflect on where we are as ODI we're trying to do that we're also doing uh, thankfully uh, we've got a research and also looking at ODI's own history mm. uh, Desiree um, looking at that uh, to see you know what's under what 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 skeletons we have in our own closet um, um, because I think that's the beginning that can only be uh, an important beginning for really uh, moving towards something which is akin to the global development ambition that you described but enough i think we have to come to a close i want to thank everybody online offline for being part of this brilliant conversation and long may it continue thank you, thank you.